Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Auto Transport Intel. It is Wednesday. It is noon central time. That means it is time for DOT compliance, where we take questions. We've got the live chat, and we've got your DOT guy, Brian Riker. He's the expert. He's with us, giving friendly advice. Now, he runs a business, but he's here uh, just giving advice, 30 minutes uh, off the record. But if you need help, okay, here's what you want to do, right? So go ahead and see below the video, share and copy, and please leave a like. Thank you very much. Grab that YouTube link, text it, email it, share it on social media. We're going to be live for 30 minutes, and Brian wants to help. If you've got a question, maybe you had a bad day at the scale, maybe you're worried about your weight, load, distribution, you need to derate your trailer, whatever it is, IFTA, ELD, IRP, he wants to help, and that's what we do here. So also, you know you can go to autotransportintel.com, click on sign up, become an ATI insider, talk to Ty. Maybe you've got just basic business questions or you're advanced, you want to grow your network, get on the round table, get on the email, be part of the network, network with us. Maybe you saw a show, send me an email, autotransportintel at gmail.com. I get questions all the time, and I refer them to the experts. That's what I do here. So um, thank you so much. And please do jump into the live chat. What's going on? Ty is in there. How are we doing? <laughs> totally. Um, and also David Tuber's transportation. I bet you can't stump Brian. We're going to get to the stump here in a minute. And then John Cochran, LAI Auto Transport from DC. So go ahead and, and you can put your questions in the live chat. And we got a couple, oh, we got some fun stuff here on how we do them. But let's go. Let's get Brian in here. Brian, can you see me and hear me okay? Yes, I can, Jay. Good afternoon. Happy to be here. What's going on? Yeah, hanging out in an airport, getting ready to fly back to the East Coast. Yeah? Um, you're, always <laughs> been, you're always on the move. We should have always. you. Yeah, you, you, are, you are Brian on the move on Wednesdays. <laughs> We, we need to put a little GPS tracker on the website. Where in the world is Brian? That actually is a great idea. <laughs> we, we say, oh, John from Finest Towing and Recover is here. What's going on? Silver hey. Mint, how we doing? <laughs> We're doing well. And so if it gets noisy, I apologize, but I'm sitting in an airport in Texas. So I'm down in Houston. Uh, I can't control the announcements in the background, but happy to be here. I can't control the announcements in the background that is a dot guy talking okay everybody <laughs> i'm gonna need okay that's pretty funny um all right let's do this let's go into let's do our fun stuff fun stuff at the beginning um oh there we go dot compliance i bet you can't stump your dot guy brian Riker. what you want to do is <laughs> come up with a really hard question um, we've had a couple close stumpers recently, but um, nothing too crazy. And I even pulled up the, the FMCSA website because we're double checking. All right. No, seriously, this is this is an exciting show, Brian. When we first came up with this idea, and you know how much I hear people say DOT compliance. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say that all the time. It's the number one thing that worries people in this business, and there's no reason, no reason to be afraid of motor carrier compliance as long as you know the rules of the game you're playing. That's right. It is right. Keyword game. Hey, how we doing? We check, <laughs> right? We It started as the flip of the week. I was doing the flip of the week, and now this is this is probably a better way to approach flip of the week. Let's do before the flip. Yes. Right. We're here to prevent it from happening. Really, we are. We, um, we're we not putting down anybody's choice of equipment. We just want you to make the best proper use of what equipment you have available. Which is why, so I'm doing it, I'm, I'm, I'm live with Sue a few weeks ago, and I came up with, you had me at dual tandems. <laughs> <laughs> it's my new meme. And it's funny, too, because... You know, I've seen it out there. No memes. We don't allow memes. Man, I love memes. <laughs> and so when you're new to the load board, right, you go to the big load board and you're like, I'm ready, I'm ready. And, and they're like, yeah, but you don't have any ratings. You can't have any loads. Mm-hmm. Well, but that, how do you get a load, a rating if you don't get a load? Right. Chicken of the egg. So, yep. Um, all right, so let's go to... 
Uh, oh yeah, so Ty, we're gonna get to that video. Actually, a couple people sent me that video, so that's coming up next. This is from John at Finest Tony Recovery. Um, the title of this picture was Disrespect. <sighs> that How you doing? is quite the load angle to get that car up. Um, I don't soft top i understand putting it up top because you don't want something to drip on it uh from above but maybe that's not the right trailer to load that car on without some extended ramps or something like that um i wouldn't feel comfortable driving it up there <laughs> it is um did you see that video of that uh what is it like a miata bouncing off the top Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a Miata though. It was oh, I can't remember an MG maybe I don't remember what that yeah, was. Yeah, it was it was something a little more expensive. Yeah, exactly. Um all right. Okay, so yeah, we're gonna come back. This is the story behind the video. Let's roll the video, roll the tape, and let's take a look at this crazy video. Um first I've got okay, first there's this. Come on. Ooh, ooh. Wow. Gnarly. Now, I think those guys, I feel like I heard Italian. <laughs> I don't think that was yeah. in the States. Not that it That's matters. That's definitely but... not in the States by the license plate, but, uh, right. wow. Um, yeah, that was tail wagging the dog. Really, it didn't look like that van should have been too bad on there. It was loaded engine forward, so 60-40 weight balance engine forward, unless the van is full of tools or something that's making it tail heavy, because that's normally what causes that tongue-like condition and makes it start wagging like that. It, it, it doesn't seem to slow down at all. No. I got it. I got it. I got it. Oh. Pretty crazy. Must be a. Wow. I guess that's a truck recording, cause right we heard. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Um. All right. Let's go. But let's go to the, the the real video. That's just the teaser. Here we go. Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, everybody's talking about it. I think this is a music video. <laughs> <laughs> I recorded it a few times because I think the music is amazing. Well, it's pretty interesting. Let's do it again. Here we go. Going again. Okay, so that's. Actually, just lucky as heck. Here comes a sign. Okay, goodbye, sign. All right. But otherwise, I mean, as far as how we doing, man, that guy got so lucky. Yeah. That's insane lucky, actually. I give him a, uh, I give him an A plus plus for load securement. Right. Those cars didn't move an inch. Uh, I'm really surprised that the hitch held up between the truck and the trailer. Um, so it, I've heard a couple of different backstories on this, but what I think the official one was, what, a medical emergency? Well, I, I okay, so I've got a, um, okay. Uh, so this is, okay, here it is. Lafayette, is that Louisiana, I guess? A local truck driver is lucky to be alive after surviving a crash on the Evangeline Thruway. That's Monday morning. Uh, police say the driver was headed southbound on the Evangeline Thruway near Donlin Street when he lost control after falling asleep. Oh, okay. So that is the official, official story then. So I believe so, because that's the yeah. police said it. Yes. Yeah, so he's been charged with careless operation after a dramatic video showed his vehicle fell off the road into a ditch strike several traffic signage poles. I mean, but the guy is so lucky. Oh, he's very lucky. That could have been much worse. Oh, my and, God. 
But this is why we have hours of service and why we're supposed to police ourselves and park it when we're tired. Amazing. Totally amazing video. Um, all right, so we do have a question. Here's Chris. Okay. Chris, by the way, Chris calls that the save of the week. <laughs> uh, okay. When using a fifth wheel trailer, is payload of truck part of the equation when picking truck? Yes. Most importantly, you want to make sure you have enough axle rating, but your payload capacity in the truck plays into that. So you want to make sure you have enough steer and drive axle rating to support the weight that's going to come off the tongue of the trailer onto your truck. And you don't really want to exceed the des designed gross combined weight rating of the truck because it's going to cause your warranty issues down the road. It'll cause you a couple other issues. But payload by itself, no. The rear axle weight rating is the most important to make sure it can support the weight that's being pushed down on it from the fifth wheel hitch. Uh, let's see. Devin is here. What else is going on? Um, okay, so yeah. And so Ty, hopefully Ty sends uh, that video over to John. Uh, let's see. All right, I've got, you know, I'm a little light on news. So, but I do have, let's see, you got that story. Okay, oh, here we go. Let's check this out. Let's do, I'm going to share the screen. Um, this came in, right? Let's talk about recalls. When sure. You get this, when you get this notice, what, 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 what needs to go through your mind? What do you do, right? What, what do you do? Well, you have to look at any recall and see how serious it is. Is it a immediate put my vehicle out of service issue because I'm going to be liable once I've been notified there's a defect if I keep operating it? Or is it something that is more of a convenience uh, that can wait and so you can schedule it at the dealer's convenience? But first thing you want to do is verify your vehicle is actually part of the campaign with contacting your dealer and make an appointment to get it addressed. Um, so that one right here with the wheels falling off uh, is that, yeah, this is the wheel hub extensions, uh, just like the Rams having a problem with wheels falling off, hubs falling apart. Yeah. As it says, highlight it in red there, do not drive the vehicle till it's been addressed. So, what do you do? You put yourself out of service and you contact the nearest OEM dealer to get it taken care of. You you can't run the vehicle in that condition because recalls go through uh, the federal, uh, uh, through the USDOT, through uh, uh, federal highway. And so federal motor carriers are aware of them as well. And so if you have a crash or something, they're going to try to point some of it at you, not all of it at the OEM manufacturer. Do you, uh, I don't know, so are you, is there any way to, to be aware of recalls that go around? I mean, there must be, I bet there's a lot, right, all the time? There, there is, and there is a database, I don't know it off the top of my head, but there is a database for vehicle recalls. Most important thing you can do is make sure the address on your vehicle registration is current where you receive your mail, because these recalls, once they're, officially issued will go to the last known owner of the vehicle at the address that motor vehicle had on file. So make sure you have a current mailing address on your registration so that you get a copy of it. And really just follow a couple of the automotive news channels. They talk about things like this before they become official recalls sometimes. But the best thing, make sure your address is update with your, with your DMV and you, there, there is a uh, website for checking recalls. You enter your VIN number. I just don't remember what it is off the top of my head. But there, there we go. There, that is good advice. Make sure, obviously, you want to make sure your information is updated. But if it's not, yeah, you won't get notices like this. Sure. 
And if you're buying a used truck, I always suggest you run and check for recall history and have that addressed before you take delivery of the truck so that you're putting it in the service with the most recent updates to it. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Uh, let's see here. We got another question for you, Brian. Okay, so Devin says, Hey, Brian, about to get my authority. Should I get my ELD before applying for my authority? You don't have to. When you apply for your authority, there is a federal minimum mandated waiting period of 21 days. They call it the public comment or public protest period. So from the date, if you were to go online this afternoon and submit everything, it's going to be a minimum of 21 days before your operating authority is granted. So you won't be able to run or do anything anyhow. If, in my experience, it takes 23 to 25 days for it to actually be granted. So in that month that you're going to be down and waiting, you can get your insurance paid for and filed. I recommend you do that somewhere around day 15 from when you've applied. No sense in paying for it longer than you have to unless you've already financed the truck and you need to have the insurance to cover it anyhow. And in that time frame, you can get your ELD. Now, I will give you one caveat. Because of the semiconductor shortage right now, electronics in general are hard to get. So in this case, you may want to go ahead and select and order your ELD early because there is no exception to using it just because you couldn't get it because it's on back order because components are not available and you cannot run without it. So in the current COVID world we're living in, yes, you may want to order your ELD a little bit early, but you don't have to normally. Normally, you can get them shipped to you within a couple of days. That's a really good point. And sitting at the scale, you're like, you know, have you heard about the microchip shortage? Yeah. Now, there is, for those of you that are having problems with your ELD or maybe it's broken and you can't get a replacement, there is a waiver you can apply for through the FMCSA to give you a temporary waiver from using an ELD because of a problem such as shortage of components. They, you go to the FMCSA website, their ELD tab, they have an address, uh, I believe it's ELD extension or ELD waiver at fmcsa.dot.gov that you would email your, your information, your motor carrier, DOT number, vehicle involved, and why you're requesting this extension for compliance. Otherwise, in a normal world, you only have eight days if your ELD fails to get it repaired, replaced, or the truck is out of service. So to right now, with components being hard to get, it may take you more than eight days. So if you have an ELD go down and it's not just a quick reset it, broken cable, something like that, I suggest you apply for the waiver immediately, even if you may not need it, even if your new one might come in in time, just so you're not out of service while you're waiting for replacement parts to come in. That's really interesting. I found a link. I put it in the live chat. Um, that's fascinating, actually. It's a really good point. I'm glad that we talked about this. Uh, Fritz says he had to cancel Keep Truck and ELD because the price went from 230 a year to 480 for one truck. Wow, I'm not aware of the price increase there. Um, you probably will see this with quite a few because in 2017, when the ELD mandate came out, there were something like 600 providers on the market. Not all of them have survived, so now the market's getting down to a much more reasonable number. So those that have survived can request a little more money for their product and services. Keep Trucking has been building a very robust product and expanding their services. And are you sure, and I'm not, I'm not questioning because I'm not an expert on Keep Trucking, but are you sure the price didn't go up because they threw in some extra services that you didn't necessarily order or need? You're the first one I've heard about the price increase from. So, uh, and again, I'm not a Keep Trucking vendor. I have a couple of clients that use them. I don't have a uh, preferred ELD to recommend to the small companies. I haven't found one yet that I really, really like. I have some for large fleets I recommend, but for the small fleet, I haven't found one yet that is super simple. Keep trucking is probably as simple as they come. Well, and here, so here I think this is great conversation because I think what 
it has been talked about is that keep trucking maybe speculation live is more of a group here that says corporate package where fritz is saying big road has a package for owner operators okay i've heard of the big road name i am not familiar with their product none of my clients use it that doesn't mean it's good bad or indifferent it just means i'm not familiar with it Cool. And so, yeah, that's because that actually, right, all those costs add up. And if you're paying sure they do. 500 a year for an ELD, man. Yeah, the, it, yeah, that's a lot. Again, the, this is a mandate that was shoved down our industry's throat without consideration as to who was going to pay for it. The big fleets, it wasn't a concern because they used them voluntarily. Plus, they were already early adopters of telematics, uh, electronic tracking for IFTA and everything else that comes with the data you get from an ELD. But for the one truck owner operator who might have been comfortable just writing his mileage down when he crosses the state line, he doesn't have somebody in the office that needs to know where his truck is or anything like that. Some of this is a little out of hand. Ty prefers F ELD. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Okay. And that's actually, right, this is the impetus of why I started the whole ELD punch, right? Having fun, Jay having fun with his props, uh, mm -hmm. right? And it's still relevant, ELD punch. I only drink it on Tuesday nights. Um, for I, a limited I, I have... <laughs> I have a prop for you right yeah, here. Yeah, all right. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make everybody jealous. Great. Being I do drive away, I still get to use one of these. Ooh. <laughs> People are like, oh, the good old days. Oh. Yes, you see? Paper. Make ELD <laughs> great again. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, because really the ELD does nothing to help with your compliance that a paper log doesn't because we verify them with the same information, the same fuel receipts, delivery receipts, etc. So, uh, and people have found ways to circumvent the ELD system. Well, and the joke is that don't you still have to have paper as a backup? Yes, you do. You must always have at least eight <laughs> like days of paper to. with you right. in case the electronic device fails. That is so funny, man. <laughs> that is funny. Um, that makes me think of like, uh, so EV, right? EV is like, man, on this like super ramp to like, mm -hmm. if, like now the headlines are like, many OEMs are like, yeah, we'll be EV only by 2030. What? EV only well, by 2030? Well, think about it. In the, in the, uh, automotive world california started it with the mandate that 30 percent of the vehicles sold in the state of california must be electric or zero emissions by 2030 and now 14 other states plus the district of columbia have joined that program and so and these are the 14 key states where that are the most populous in the country so basically we have 40 50 percent of the u.s population will be under mandate by 2030 where their own where 30 percent of their options will have to be zero emission and electric is our only true zero emission choice right now for motor vehicles so these fleets have to do this uh where we're seeing it in the not necessarily in the car hauler world as electric car haulers, but we're seeing it in the chassis world for when we're building tow trucks and smaller vehicles. There's been a lot of requests for battery electric hybrid or pure battery only trucks. Uh, and I know that there is an electric drive axle that uh, Eaton or Dana is experimenting with that international is incorporating into their medium duty vehicles but this electric drive axle has been proposed to be installed in a trailer to give you a little bit of extra push from your trailer if you will uh and there's a lot of actual possibilities there like the way they use powered trailers for moving heavy haul loads and stuff that the technology is almost there the battery is what is weak but we are going to start seeing it uh i believe it was pennsylvania just has a bill going through the state house to give a weight exemption to electric only commercial vehicles to allow them to exceed axle and gross weights by a few
few hundred or a thousand pounds to make up for the fact that the batteries are heavier than the fuel tank and the weight of an internal combustion motor. Did you see, um, here, I'm pulling this up here. Uh, did you see, have you seen this Rivian R1T camp kitchen uh, truck? You can. No, I have not seen that one. Okay, so I just saw it's like big news right now or something. Uh, so my point is with the, with the electric and the technology, now you've got different room available in the truck. Plus it's electricity instead of gas, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, yeah. Now they, Rivian came up with, it's in the, I, I don't, isn't that where the gas tank was? And more now, or less. Yeah. Right? And now, so now they've got this whole slide out deal where uh, slide it out, you can cook, you can do dishes, there's, you turn it around, mm -hmm. and there's drawers in it, well, <laughs> and then you look slide at it the... back in, and there's plugs, it's it's wild. Yep. Yeah, put, put a little camper shell on that, and you got it made, but uh, well, look at the Ford F-150 electric, they took where the engine apartment was, put a flat floor in it, and they call it a frunk, and so you have a locking compartment like a trunk on a sedan, so you don't necessarily have to have a tenue cover on your bed if you want to keep something secure, you can put it up front. Get better weight distribution across your axles and stuff too by putting some of the load in the front of the truck and some of it in the bed. Um, there's been proposals for your class seven and eight over the road trucks to replace some of the fuel pumps at your traditional truck stop with hot swap battery racks like they use for forklifts in the warehouse where you'll pull up an automated machine will slide your battery pack out of the side of your truck, slide a fully charged one in and away you go in the same amount of time it takes you to pump 150 gallons of diesel fuel. It's, it's, the technology is it's wild. So I'm not bucking it. I'm just, uh, I don't know. We're swimming well, in like new information. Well, the thing is, the electric vehicle isn't even new. Smith Electric Vehicle had their first electric delivery truck. It was a half ton or three quarter ton truck in, I think, 1908. It was battery powered, lead acid battery. It had like a, a 10 mile range around the city and it would charge up all night. But electric vehicles for the commercial uh, segment are nothing new. They, they almost predate the internal combustion engine powered truck. We need to get you a DOT compliance microphone that you can drop. <laughs> because you just dropped the DOT compliance microphone. Well, we did awesome. a very little compliance today, but uh, <laughs> I love talking general trucking as well. And um, well, this is compliance, though, because yeah. for the, our operators that operate in the state of California that have to meet their emissions, you're going to have to consider what type of vehicle you buy if you want to do work in their states and some of these other states. So it really is regulatory compliance as well. Uh, Brian, Fritz says, Brian, best pre-emissions semi-truck for owner-operators? Um, they all, it's all a matter of personal preference. So, again, just like buying a new truck, the best one is what engine are you comfortable working on or... Oh, is your local mechanic comfortable working on? So is your local guy a cat guy or is he a Detroit guy, a Cummins guy? Because, again, you need service. Me personally, my personal preference, and this has nothing to do with anything other than my ability to work on them. I've driven several of them. Pre-emissions, I like the Cummins N14 motor or a little 11-liter uh, uh but I like the Cummins N14 motor. They're easy to work on. They're powerful. They're quiet. You can get parts almost anywhere. Um, they're more fuel efficient than the cat motor. Uh, now, there are a lot of guys out there that love that yellow iron, too. But me personally, I like a truck that's readily available, not too expensive. Um, so my favorite pre-emissions truck would be an international 92 or 9400 series uh, with an N14 Cummins in it and probably a 13 or an 18 speed, depending upon the trailer I'm pulling, maybe even a 10 speed if I'm pulling a smaller trailer. Uh, I can't get in the rear end ratio and all that because that depends on where you haul mountains, flats, but I like the N14. It's a good, simple motor to work on. Uh, 
But really, it's what are you comfortable with and what can you get serviced in the area you run in. I guarantee somebody, either live, on demand, or on the podcast, heard what you said and was like, that is a really, that's really good advice. You, you made somebody think. I can, I can hear the gears grinding. And what we could do, it's called DOT compliance, but yeah, DOT compliance and equipment. Because I think we mm -hmm. talk equipment like every week. We, we talk equipment, we talk general trucking business for a little bit, and it all meshes together because you really do need to have a full understanding of the industry if you're going to be successful in it. And my being a, a former small fleet owner, business owner, uh, I have familiarity with all of these components. I've chosen to make compliance my... Uh, my area of expertise, but that doesn't mean that I can't give advice in other areas and I'm happy to talk trucks anytime. I really enjoy it still. Yeah. When well, you're, you're with equipment regularly, right? Driving yes. equipment, delivering yes. equipment, talking equipment. I, I work for one of the largest, uh, auto transport and towing equipment distributors in the nation. And so I visit with fleet owners and I still get out and play with this stuff and operate it, train people how to operate it every day. It's just what I do. I share the um, on air at your dot com. That is the email. That's the fastest way to get to Brian through email. On air at your dot dot com. Send him an email in between Wednesdays. He'll reply. You can leave comments below this video. I'll tap Brian on the shoulder. And uh, I wanted to read, Fritz says, now you can cook for the DOT roadside inspections. <laughs> yeah, why not? Hey, hey, it's like the trucking in the 70s where someone would get out their charcoal hibachi grill, someone else had some meat, maybe you were delivering to a warehouse and they rejected a couple hundred pounds, so you, you got some beef brisket or something that you want to cook up. Everyone would take a little open the back door, take a little bit out of their trailer, and we'd have a picnic when we are stuck there over the weekend. Dude, I tell you, seeing that truck, I really, I really like that idea. I don't know how mm -hmm. much I'd use it, and then what if the thing doesn't go back in? Okay, and you know, <laughs> anyway, right? I can see lots it, of possible. Stop, stop poking holes in their gimmick. They want to use that oh, to sell that. It's pretty cool, and you can lift the units off the shelf, and now you've got actually like a workbench. Mm-hmm. It's pretty amazing. I could, I could see that as a great option for the contractor you already have 110 volt power available exactly. with an inverter on the truck you pull out your workbench you go to work you do your thing you pack it all up the way you go i know and as the batteries get stronger right and you get better charges i mean now you could really yeah you could work remote i saw the use of one of those i think it was the f-150 lightning powering the um not the i don't want to say roach coach but you know the food truck right yes that's F uh, Ford is promoting that you can use it as an emergency generator backup power for your house when the power goes out. Oh, so for oh. folks like you that are in an area that gets some twisters through and wires down where you might lose power for a couple of days, hey. it, it's something to think about. Dude, I could do I could do a remote live ATI. We could do <laughs> a remote live ATI DOT compliance and equipment show. And then cook some flapjacks for the audience. Sure. Hey, right. I, I, do, I do remote every week, so. <laughs> Man, I like this. All right, cool. Um, well, Brian, I've kept you long enough. Thank you for making this happen. I know you're at the airport. You did a great job getting set up. It looks great. You sound great. We appreciate it every Wednesday. Hey, I love it, man. Thank you, everybody. On air at yourdotguy.com. Happy to answer your questions. See how I can help. Also, notification in three weeks. Let's see, what is today? Today is the 30th? The 30th. So let me look at my calendar here. So we've got, okay, we're gonna, we got the 7th, we'll have a show. The 14th, we'll have a show. The 21st, I will be on vacation. No show on the 21st. Okay. You heard it here live. Okay. And it'll be Sounds good. On the 28th. So, all right, so that is it. Everybody, thank you guys so much for saying hello in the live chat. It's super cool to see you all here week after week. And we get to share. We get to hang out. We get to chill out for 30 minutes and talk about yes. compliance and equipment. It's a good time. So, all right, Brian, 
have a great uh, have a great Fourth of July. You got a couple days off, right? Yes, I do. I'm taking a long weekend. I hope we all are. We all deserve. Yes. It, right. And we can actually we can breathe about it. Right. It's yeah. okay to be around people. No, nobody's come over freaking out that I've been here for thirty some minutes with my mask off in the airport. Yes, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Ty, yeah. meanwhile, Ty's like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I haven't done anything <laughs> different ever at all. Well, hell, it really hasn't been all that different for me. Like I said, I hit 44 or 48 states last year. Yeah. The only thing different was I ate in the hotel room a lot more than a restaurant. Right, exactly. Cool. But All right, everybody. Okay, thanks, Take Brian. Care. We'll see you later, man. Take care. <laughs> Bye. All right, see ya.